All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kobe Rizik, and I'm the president of the William F. Buckley Jr. Program at Yale. Welcome to this Zoom lecture titled How to Lose Friends and Influence People with Professor Joshua Katz of Princeton University. Before I introduce Professor Katz formally, I want to say a few words about the Buckley Program. First, for those of you who don't know, the William F. Buckley Jr. Program is an organization dedicated to promoting intellectual diversity and open political discussion at Yale. We do so in a variety of ways, including hosting lectures, dinner seminars, firing line debates, and an annual conference. Our over 300 Buckley Fellows have a wide range of political beliefs, but they all stand united against the formation of a liberal-only echo chamber on campus. By providing Yale students with a forum to engage meaningfully with serious conservative thought, the Buckley Program forwards its mission of a more open and more representative political atmosphere especially at a university where the mission is the cultivation and creation of new knowledge, Buckley Fellows believe that all perspectives, including those of the right, must be heard and examined in good faith. You can learn more about the program and how to become a fellow on our website, buckleyprogram.com. All Yale undergraduate and graduate students are eligible. So if you're a fellow now, please uh, share this opportunity with your peers. Now on to Professor Katz. Joshua Katz is Kautzen Professor in the Humanities and Professor of Classics at Princeton University, where he is also a member of the programs in linguistics, teacher preparation, translation, and intercultural communication, as well as a faculty associate of the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions. The holder of degrees from Yale, Oxford, and Harvard, Katz, Professor Katz has taught at Princeton since 1998 and is the recipient of numerous awards for his scholarship and teaching on languages, literatures, and cultures from about 6,000 years ago to the present. As far as format this afternoon, for those of you who are joining us, uh, we will start with about a 30-minute lecture from Professor Katz and then move right into questions from the moderators, and from me, and from the audience. Uh, the event will conclude at 5.30 p.m. Eastern time. So if you're an audience member, uh, please take the opportunity to submit a question uh, using the Zoom Q&A feature, which you should be able to find on the bottom of your screen. Uh, with that, please join me in warmly welcoming Professor Joshua Katz to the Buckley Program. Uh, we're honored to have you with us, Professor. Thank you very much, Kobe, for the invitation to address the Buckley Program. Surely every talk you hear these days begins with the words, I wish we could be together in person. And indeed, I do wish that we could be together in person, not least because I was exceptionally happy in my four college years at Yale. And I love New Haven in a way that few seem to understand. Still, for all that, in many ways, I have to admit that I wish we were not here at all. I am a deeply private person. I describe myself as a library rat. I do not enjoy the spotlight, especially when it shines outside my areas of academic expertise, which often involve people who lived thousands of years ago, and my interest in the rough and tumble of contemporary sociopolitics is largely born of recent unfortunate necessity. Above all, I am used neither to losing friends nor to influencing people. And yet here I am, here we are. I'd like to start off by telling you who I am and who I have been over the course of my career. This is important because many things that people have been and are saying about me, you may have read some of them, are dishonest and outrageous, bearing no resemblance to what was said about me until not quite five months ago. I have taught at Princeton for nearly 23 years. I have won the top teaching prizes from the university. I have received numerous national and international accolades for my scholarship, and my administrative competence has led to my being appointed and elected to a wide range of local, national, and international scholarly committees. A linguist by training, a classicist by profession, and a comparative philologist at heart, I am drawn to both rigorous scientific method and heartfelt humanistic inquiry. I get through boring lectures by writing out verbal paradigms, but I'm also a great believer in the power of big ideas, in the power of philosophy, 
literature, music, and the visual arts to enlighten, comfort, and entertain. For those of you who are Yaleys, I'd sum it up by saying that I loved directed studies and I majored in linguistics. I believe it reasonable to expect people in a given society to have more than a passing acquaintance with certain core ideas, ideals, and works. I also believe it important to have a strong acquaintance with ideas, ideals, and works that lie outside this core and outside one's own society. And I have spent my career teaching and writing on subjects both traditional and untraditional, from Egyptian hieroglyphs to religious texts of ancient India, to classical Latin poetry, to medieval Irish law, to the Native American languages of Southern California, to 21st century experimental fiction. I am, in other words, someone who takes a lowercase c Catholic and lowercase l liberal worldview. Let me say something about how this Catholic and liberal worldview has played out this year. In the spring, I taught first in person and then of course online two courses, both of which received rave reviews. The one was second semester beginning ancient Greek, by the end of which the students could read Plato in the original. The other was a lecture class on the history of English that I have taught before many times, though rarely with quite this level of success, a class in which I encourage dialogue and debate allowing students to try on for size in as open a way as possible, a range of ideas about such difficult topics as taboo words and what does and does not count as good English. To my simultaneous delight and chagrin, one junior this time around called it the wokest class he had taken at Princeton. And in the current semester, which is now drawn to a close, I have again been teaching two classes a graduate seminar on comparative grammar, and a freshman seminar on the history and practice of wordplay, titled Wordplay, A Rye Plod from Babel to Scrabble. This, a course I invented some years ago, the Time Magazine in 2015 listed among the 11 bizarre college courses we actually want to take, and the Daily Beast in 2011 called one of the 18 hottest college courses in the country. All this sounds good, right? Well, the good news is that the dozen students in wordplay, all of them first year undergraduates, are as passionate as any I have known. This despite being stretched over nine hours of time zones and having little to no physical knowledge of the university they are nominally attending. But here's the bad news. I am lucky to have any students at all. To my knowledge, before this fall, no colleague had ever told a student not to take a class with me. Indeed, I know that many colleagues, not to mention administrators at Princeton's residential colleges, have regularly played up my courses. This year, however, at least two incoming first year students who had applied and whom I had admitted to my seminar were told to run away. Beyond this, it seems perfectly possible that some students didn't even apply after reading the many highly negative things that were said about me over the summer on the list serve for the entering class of 2024. Whatever the case may be, things have worked out just fine. And I am truly grateful to all the students for reminding me week after week that all is not lost, that a group of smart and curious students of different backgrounds and with different intellectual, sociocultural and religious commitments can band together to do great things in what is surely the only class in the country in which we read both Dr. Seuss and James Joyce. But then there is the graduate seminar. Here things are different. Exactly one graduate student in my department is enrolled in it. He's terrific and we're having as merry a time as is possible with masked interaction in a room that seats 150 people. But the other graduate students will never find out what they're missing since nearly all of them are boycotting me. Why are they boycotting me? Well, I assume you know, but let me give an overview of the situation. 
On July 4th, several hundred of my Princeton colleagues, that's a significant percentage of the faculty, promulgated an open letter to the administration with a sprawling list of requests and demands in the name of anti-racism. Now, anti-racism has quickly become a major buzzword, and you do not need to be a linguist to recognize that it does not have its attractive face value meaning, but instead promotes the insidious race-based discrimination of its own kind. It is linguistically and societally perverse that racists, anti-racists, and anti-anti-racists are these days all by definition racists, and that many deem it impermissible to claim that one is not racist, which makes it pretty well impossible for people to use language to defend themselves against cooked up charges of racism. In any case, the Princeton letter is an embarrassment. Yes, some of the 48 requests and demands are sensible. I will be very glad if the university makes admissions fee waivers transparent, easy to use, and well advertised. Other requests and demands take a side on issues that have been in the air for a while and about which reasonable people of goodwill will disagree. Here an example would be eliminating standardized tests as a requirement for undergraduate and graduate admission, an idea for which most people with whom I have discussed the matter can see arguments on both sides. But many further demands are flat out unreasonable. One that particularly irks me is of only local interest, but it shows just how blithely professors will run over a colleague who stands in their way. We demand, write the, dem the members of the professorial mob, and I quote, we demand that a director from an underrepresented group be appointed to a certain position, I will avoid saying which one, when the current director's term expires on June 30th, 2021. What is essential to understand here is that when at least the primary instigators of the faculty letter wrote these words, they were well aware that they were launching an ad hominem attack on the distinguished and wholly blameless colleague who had already been appointed to the position in question. Well, this is a matter of Princeton internal politics. Other demands are more obviously consequential and to a great many people. Take, for example, the ones scattered throughout that are flat out illegal precisely because they are racist. My colleagues would give various financial rewards specifically to faculty of color, a term they don't define, ignoring the basic fact that this would be a violation of Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And still further demands, while not illegal, are widely considered immoral. The best example in this category is the creation of a new faculty committee to investigate research that the committee regards as racist and to discipline those responsible. How could anyone sign such a document? This was and remains baffling to me. It was also apparently baffling to Connor Friedersdorf, a reporter for The Atlantic, hardly a conservative publication, who tried to get the signatories to explain to him what they were thinking, with little success, since only a few were actually willing to stand up and defend themselves. In this environment, someone had to stand up and dissent. I could not tell you why I stood up and did so. I had no history of making waves of this kind. Indeed, to be truthful, there are many times in the past when I know I ought to have spoken out against one or another outrage, but did not, largely because it was convenient to ignore what was going on since it did not immediately affect my comfortable day-to-day -day existence. That was cowardice. For whatever reason though, in July I'd had enough and I put away that cowardice. My Declaration of Independence was published in Quillette four days after the open letter. It was signed by no one but myself, and I take full responsibility for it. I believed then, 
and I believe still now that my tone was largely measured. I did not write a hit piece. I tried to say positive things about some of the demands and tried to keep my rhetoric short and to the point and not belabor objections. I also went out of my way to express goodwill to the signatories, ending by writing, quote, if you signed the letter independently and thoughtfully, good for you. Many members of the Princeton community, if community it still is, read my words with no goodwill at all and in as uncharitable a way as possible, turning immediately to my vilification. Quite a number of these people had been my friends, or rather my friends with scare quotes, because what sorts of friends sign their emails to you XOXO one day, and then the next day, without saying so much as one word to you directly, loudly call in public for your head, or scheme against you on social media, or almost worst of all, pretend you don't exist? What sorts of friends do this? The answer is supplied by my actual friends who grew up under totalitarian regimes in China, Poland, and Romania. People whose own supposed friends regularly betrayed them and their families in an effort to gain power for themselves. These friends of mine know well what real betrayal is, and they are depressed that the country to which they fled, the United States, is so quickly abandoning the epithet the land of the free. In any case, within days of my declaration in Quillette, the president of Princeton issued a personal denunciation. Some of my colleagues, both in the Department of Classics and outside, were quoted and themselves published disgusting and plainly false things about me in the local student newspaper, which flaunted and has continued to flaunt its partisanship. Four colleagues in Classics flashing their official titles, published a scurrilous statement against me on the departmental homepage, making the outrageous claim that I had, quote, deliberately, unquote, placed, quote, colleagues, students, and alums at serious risk. A good number of former students, many of whom owe some of their success to my teaching, advising, and letters of recommendation made clear that I was an awful human being with some vocally suggesting I should lose my job. And the Princeton administration announced ominously that it would quote, be looking into the matter further. In this firestorm, there was some attention to that matter of the committee to investigate racist research. Some people, both at Princeton and elsewhere, went on record to explain why what I will call a star chamber was in fact a good thing. I guess I have to commend them for their candor, though it frightens the hell out of me. Still, nearly all the anti-Cats denunciation was not about my reactions to the more dangerous demands, but rather about a few words I'd written in one paragraph about a defunct student group at Princeton, the Black Justice League or BJL, which I described as having been, quote, a small local terrorist organization. Now linguists can be as guilty of imprecision in language as everyone else. And there is no doubt, but that my language about the BJL was blunt, or maybe it was sharp. The fact that the same few words can be characterized as both blunt and sharp, which if one were talking about a physical tool would be an oxymoronic impossibility, goes to show just how dangerous it can be to use words at all. To allow oneself to be quoted as saying anything shows just how easy it is for people to be misunderstood. I understand why some people didn't like my description of the BJL, but I and others don't like many things the BJL did. And I did think about the phrase before enshrining it in print. The original terrorists were the Jacobins, known to all for their role in the reign of terror. Though when one uses the term terrorist now, it is rarely with reference to the French Revolution. 
This should not come as a shock. Language changes, it changes all the time. And words can acquire senses through metaphor and other processes that they did not have before. These changes can be contentious. There will always be periods before something is fully settled when people disagree sharply over one or the other usage. For example, right now over the definitions of the English words man and woman, which were not seriously controversial only a few years ago, but are now a lexical and social hot potato. More to the point, we have for four years been hearing the phrase, President Trump is a Nazi, though no one who says this believes that he is a member of the American or any other Nazi party. This is metaphor at work. Some find it appropriate, some find it annoying, but most people shrug their shoulders and move on. Let me give one more example. Ayan Hirsi Ali, who knows all too well what non-metaphorical terrorism is and who should have given the disinvitation lecture this year, tweeted the following over the summer. In fact, she tweeted it on July 14th, a date of some interest to Jacobins. Here's what she wrote, quote, the New York Times was once a great paper, not anymore. It is now held hostage, note the metaphor, by a small group of censorship terrorists, note the metaphor. Yesterday, they hounded out James Bennett, and today it is Barry Weiss who must leave. Who is next? Indeed, who is next? The answer is a lot of people. Almost no day goes by when I don't receive an email or a phone call from some other newly embattled professor who is scared and looking for help, or at least for camaraderie in this madness. But back to the BJL, which I not even a week before Ion Hirsi Ali's tweet had labeled a terrorist organization. The BJL was active on the Princeton campus from 2014 to 2016 during which time it went after one fellow black student with particular vigor, verbally vilifying her in public, calling her all sorts of unsavory names and accusing her of quote, performing white supremacy. Other students, as well as faculty and administrators, the BJL accused without evidence of being racists and white supremacists. You will all have watched videos from the summer in which Black Lives Matter protesters went up to or surrounded people who were eating peaceably and demanded unpeaceably that they raise a fist in solidarity. Well, the BJL cultivated a similar attitude of fear and intimidation. While it did not resort to physical violence, by acting aggressively against those who did not agree with the group's goals and by wantonly using epithets like racist that strike fear even in the strongest and most upright members of society, the BJL worked actively to stifle dissent. Its members' speech may have been protected by law, but they were terrorizing. Still, let's say that you believe I was wrong to call the BJL a terrorist organization, that I was being imprecise either by employing an inappropriate metaphor or as others have suggested, by being hyperbolic. In that case, let me suggest that you be very careful of how you express yourselves because if you think you can escape the woke juggernaut, you are mistaken. The curse of Babel, the curse of misunderstanding another's language, whether willfully or not, will turn on you too and possibly just for uttering one unorthodox syllable or a wrong word or God forbid, an unfashionable idea. In the article in the Atlantic that I mentioned earlier, a fellow Princeton professor chided, chided Friedersdorf, the author of that piece for his questions, telling him that quote, it is disappointing to me that in a fairly detailed and comprehensive letter concerning anti-racism, journalists such as yourself and others have seized on a single detail and created more discourse about it than about 97% of the rest of the letter. 
Okay, got it. So one thing that is disappointing to me is that so many colleagues have seized on a single detail in my piece and created more discourse about it than about, well, I'm not going to do the calculation, but you get the idea. Nor is it a matter of merely ignoring context. I have an ax myself to grind when it comes to imprecise language, specifically the imprecise language of my critics. Commentator after commentator among Princeton students and faculty, some of them just in the past few days and weeks on national television and in the pages of the Daily Princetonian have claimed that I called students terrorists. I did not call students terrorists. It's not just that I spoke of no one by name. I said nothing about current students. I spoke about alumni, people who had once been Princeton students and belonged to an organization that has not existed for four years. When a university wants to look into something negative that a professor says about alumni, never mind something accurate about alumni, something has gone seriously wrong. And when my critics continue to claim that I said things that I did not, that shows an inexcusably cavalier attitude to truth. Fortunately, I have received very strong support for my words with positive reactions in abundance to my declaration in Quillette and later in July to the lead op-ed one Monday in the Wall Street Journal, as well as here and there in the month since on radio and television. Indeed, there has been an outpouring of positive sentiment and I am in the uncomfortable position of being a pariah in my department and in my discipline but anything but a pariah everywhere else. The attention my case has received in the non-local media is almost entirely positive. With the editorial board of the Wall Street Journal and the Foundation for Individual Rights and in Education leading the way. With the American Council of Trustees and Alumni naming me a hero of intellectual freedom, with columnists and pundits in papers and magazines and podcasts here and abroad chastising Princeton, and with Matt Taibbi being his usual devastating self in a wildly funny but deeply depressing piece titled, The Left is Now the Right. My case was even alluded to on the floor of the United States Senate. The good news is that the ratio is 75 to one of positive to negative email messages, letters, texts, and phone calls that I have received from politicians, academics, and shopkeepers, from liberals, conservatives, and centrists, and from white people, black people, and those who are neither. I have been sustained by these communications and by the lovely words I have received from students, colleagues, and true friends in Princeton largely outside the humanities, I regret to say, and it is unfortunately the case that some colleagues, especially in the humanities, have tempered their support by stating that they would never allow themselves to come forward in my defense for fear that what has happened to me might happen then to them. Still, while most, though fortunately not all of the classicists have behaved abominably, it's nice to know that there is still some hope in academia. And at Princeton, I'm glad to say there is hope as long as the university sticks to its own rules and regulations. Not too long after announcing that it would be looking into the matter, the university acknowledged that my speech is protected and that I am not being investigated. And indeed it had to do so for a reason that is as simple as it is important. In April of 2015, Princeton became, by formal vote of the faculty and with the support of the president, the second institution of higher education in the country after the University of Chicago to adopt the so-called Chicago principles of free expression. These sane principles, which Yale has yet to adopt, are legally enforceable. They protect my speech, 
They protect the speech of colleagues and current students who would put me in the stocks. They protect the speech of Princeton's president. Outside marginal, though very important exceptions, such as child pornography and incitement to violence, free speech is a bedrock principle, an American principle, not a partisan matter, not a matter of left versus right, or at least it should be. Most of you will have encountered the regressive attitude of many progressives, that the very phrase free speech no longer has the common sense meaning it did a year ago, namely speech that is free, but is instead a right-wing dog whistle. This is terrifying. I have not used the word canceled in this talk because I don't like it. For one thing, it sounds so final. And it's ironic that some of the biggest supporters of redemptive policies when it comes to the presently and formerly incarcerated, policies I generally support, by the way, are also some of the loudest voices in favor of destroying the lives of those who say things they don't like. But beyond this, while some people have certainly mistreated me, and while it is clear that life will never be the same again, I have not been canceled in any final sense. I am a professor at a prestigious university. I have a loving and supportive family, and I refuse to allow myself to be silenced for non-existent crimes. Indeed, the idea of being canceled by other Princeton professors is just silly. My colleagues and I live a life of what is to most people, frankly, unimaginable privilege. We and our colleagues at Yale and at other top tier institutions should be using that privilege to build, not destroy. Much of the illiberalism that is sweeping the nation comes out of academia. We all live on campus now in the excellent words of Andrew Sullivan who left New York Magazine in that same crazy week in July when Barry Weiss quit the New York Times and Princeton quit me. The way to combat illiberalism is to be blunt and sharp at the same time. Stand firm, do not give an inch, do not apologize for something for which you should not apologize. I do have one regret. If I had realized that all attention would be focused on my phrase terrorist organization, I would not have used it. But that is not an admission of error. And let's face it, if I had not used it, my sniveling friends and other mendacious critics would have had to object to something else. I have lost a lot of friends these months, a lot of friends, if I may use ironic emphasis to show just how attenuated the meaning of this word has become in English. I don't like saying that it was worth it since infamy suits me even less than fame but it probably was. For one thing, I have made a lot of new friends, including, thank heavens, at Princeton. But I like to think that I've also made a difference and for once in my life had an influence that will, in due time, help bring this dreadful age of dreadful illiberalism to a close. And it will come to a close for cancel culture is not culture. It is mob law and a society based on the misrule of the mob cannot hold. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Katz. Uh, I have no doubt that if this was an in-person event that uh, uh, fascinating and, and extremely well-worded lecture that you just uh, provided would have certainly rendered a lot of applause. So thank you for that. I, I really do appreciate it. Um, My understanding is that at Yale, a lot of people would in fact have walked out. Uh, among, among those who are involved with the Buckley program, I, I would say uh, you, would have, you would have got applause. Um, I, want, I know you don't like the word cancel, as you just mentioned, um, but I want to apologize preemptively because I'm going to use it a few times in this question. That's fine. Um, uh, so I want to ask you about, I guess, what I would call the uh, cascading effect of campus cancel culture, namely that 
uh, the larger the group of cancelers grows, the more pressure uh, that university leaders feel to hop on board. Um, President Eisgruber's default position, um, even though he later absolved you of being investigated, his default position was to condemn your statement and accuse you of violating your obligation to free speech responsibly. Um, rather than to defend the rights of a member of the faculty of the university he leads. So why do we see so many similar responses from university leaders who today tend to err on the side of condemnation and cancellation before all facts are known or a perspective is fully understood, irrespective of the damage that's done to people's reputations in the meantime? Is it simply their attempt to shore up their own positions or is it something more? It's, it's hard to know because although the number of, let's call them cancellations, is certainly continuing apace, it is my impression, contrary to what you just said, that university presidents and other administrators are being a little bit more careful about coming out and condemning faculty members than just a few months ago. And so it is my impression. So let's take, for example, the University of Chicago. Uh, there is a case right now involving a professor of geophysical sciences, Doreen Abbott. Uh, it's a very interesting case. And Professor uh, President Robert Zimmer, who uh, after all presided over the um, the, the uh, adoption of the Chicago principles at the University of Chicago, and who has been a, a staunch proponent of free speech, uh, President Zimmer uh, did not then go out last week and condemn Professor Abbott. In fact, quite the contrary. Um, that is not what happens everywhere, but I think it is going to happen. I think it is happening and I think it will continue to happen more and more. So you started by saying there are ever more cancelers, and that is true. Uh, but there are also, therefore, ever more people that I would prefer not to call, but let's just call them the canceled. And the fact is that once you have a significant number of prominent people at prominent institutions who have been, quote, canceled, uh, then there's a certain weight on the other side. And I think you're starting to see that weight, and I think we're going to continue to see that weight. Um, I, I believe that the canceled if we can put it like that, are going to win. Uh, thank you, Professor. And just a reminder to our audience members, if you have a question, uh, please submit it in the Zoom Q&A feature. Uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, Professor Zimmer, you talked about this in your lecture and you also talked about it um, extensively in your, uh, your Declaration of Independence in Quillet in uh, early July. Um, and you quoted the statement, uh, the faculty statement um, that called for a committee composed entirely of faculty, this is a quote, composed entirely of faculty that would oversee the investigation and discipline of racist behaviors, incidents, research and publication on the part of faculty. Um, guidelines on what counts as racist behavior, incidents, research, et cetera, will be authored by, uh, I guess, that faculty committee uh, for the incorporation into the usual set of rules and procedures. And uh, you noted that out of the whole statement, this is what was most disturbing to you. Um, I think rightfully so. And I'm, I'm curious, um, you know, number one, uh, what, you know, made this particular call, this particular demand in the statement stand out to you um, above all else? Um, and secondarily, what do you think it says, I guess, more broadly, um, less even about campus culture and students, but among academics and sort of where the, if you want to call it academia or the scientific profession is, where um, even if you go through a peer reviewed process or, you know, your methods are correct, there are just some conclusions that you're not allowed to come to, for example. I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Right. Well, there's, there's a lot in there, of course. Uh, let me... Let, let me start by reiterating something that I said a few minutes ago, which is that the one issue, aside from my phrase, a small local terrorist organization, that people actually did latch onto and talk about and debate is precisely this. 
Um, there wasn't nearly as much about this as there was about my one phrase, but there was something. There was a fair amount of back and forth, including in the national press, by some very prominent people. Some saying uh, that, of course, this would be a wonderful idea. Some other people saying, of course, this would be a terrible idea. And then some people responding to the and, and so on and so forth. So there was some attention to this, which suggests that the fact that it was for me the worst thing in the letter was probably on target. And I do have to give credit to those people who came out and defended. I, I think it's completely indefensible. Um, almost everybody that I know, including the people who are willing occasionally to say a word to me who signed the letter also think that this is indefensible. But, you know, there are some arguments out there and you can read them for why they it might actually be something to defend. I, I'm not going to make those arguments. I think these arguments are uh, nuts, uh, but they are out there. So this is obviously a matter of some real interest. Um, of course, what's striking is that that is, in my view, immoral but it would not be illegal. There are some things in the letter that are actually illegal. So you might have thought that I would say that those were even worse. Well, I think those are pretty bad also, but the thing about uh, illegality is that people can change laws. I hope very much that we're not going to change the laws of the country so that uh, certain groups of people based solely on pigmentation of one kind or another receive greater perks than others. I think that would be an extremely bad thing to do, but it would actually be possible to make laws to that effect. As for, though, a star chamber of intellectual inquiry, that's not a matter of law. That's a matter of academic culture. Um, and I have been probably too much in my life involved in academic culture to the exclusion of, uh, well, the rest of the world. I mean, I really have been much too much of an ivory tower person, but I do as a result know something then about the ivory tower and how it works and how it could work and how it should work and how it should not. Um, and the idea of destroying that tower from within for reasons that have nothing to do with say federal laws struck me as a particularly bad idea. So that's why I, that's why I harped on that. Um, you did say something, there was a third point that you wanted me to address, but I've now managed to forget what it was. I guess it was just about more broadly uh, academia and academics and, um, you know, the, well, yes, why it is that things can pass process. peer review and yet, and yet are condemned. Um, that there are some conclusions that you just can't come to. I, you know, uh, this, this idea has been around for some time. Um, it was around in some sense, actually, when I was an undergraduate at Yale. I, I uh, um, arrived at Yale in 1987. Uh, that was the year of the closing of the American mind. Uh, there has been some attention to what it is that one really should not investigate. Um, for, for quite some time, though, though this is now building. Um, I, I, I just don't see how it is that you can stop people from doing real research in the things that they are interested in. It so happens that most of the things I myself am especially interested in are at least in a normal world, not wildly controversial. So I don't have any personal experience of any real kind, and I don't expect to have any personal experience of real kind of actually doing academic work on subjects that are quote unquote taboo. But who gets to decide what's taboo? It, it seems to me a great, great, great mistake to stop people from doing things. Of course, people may do lousy work. They may come to conclusions that are in fact incorrect. And then there are processes uh, and now also social media to stop that. But stopping people from doing it in the first place just because, that's a huge error. Thank you, Professor. I want to move on to some audience questions. Uh, the first one I'm going to ask uh, from an audience member says, I am regularly asked for advice by free thinking students who aspire to an academic career. Free thinking is in quotes. Yeah. I always give the same grim answer. 
and less than until you have tenure, you cannot afford to dissent from the progressive agenda, period. In other words, if you do not assiduously toe the line, especially on any potentially sensitive topic, and more and more falls into that category, of course, you will almost certainly not be hired or promote, promoted. Do you agree with this? And what advice would you give to those same students? Right, that's an excellent question and a, and a, and a very, very hard one to give a simple answer to. And indeed the answers that I will now give are probably somewhat different from the ones I would have given a couple of years ago. And so one may expect that the answers a couple of years from now will be different still. I hope, I hope better, but, but probably different. So the first thing to say is that I think we have to distinguish between people who are still students and people who are professors. So people who want to be hired versus people who want to be promoted. Um, let, me, let me start at the top and let me emphasize again the importance of the Chicago principles. If you are a tenured professor at one of the 75 colleges or universities in the country that have adopted the Chicago principles, then in my view, you have absolutely nothing uh, to lose because you are legally protected. Um, let me just put in parentheses here that I believe that the exact wording and the exact legal status of the Chicago, uh, of versions of the Chicago principles at colleges and universities are a little bit different. So one has one version, another has another. And so don't now take my word for this. You have to consult the way your own college or university does things. But basically, if you're tenured at an institution with the Chicago principles, then you really should be able to express yourself freely. Now, if you're untenured at a place that has the Chicago principles, then in fact, the same rules apply because at least at Princeton, the Chicago principles apply to everybody. Would I suggest to a junior colleague at Princeton, which has the Chicago principles, to go out there and start saying things that are going to get him or her in trouble? Well, uh, that, depends on, that depends on the fortitude of the person. Um, for somebody with great fortitude, I might say cautiously give it a try because you will be protected. You have to be protected by law, but still. So the question then is what happens if you're at a university that doesn't have the Chicago principles? Uh, and, and here I'll say two things. One, try to get the Chicago principles. And two, until you have the Chicago principles, whether you are tenured or untenured, but especially if you're untenured, be careful. So then there's the question of how you get to be a professor. So what happens if you're a student right now? What kind of advice should you give to students? Well, you know, we're in a very, very bad time for reasons that don't directly have to do with the things I've just been discussing, uh, for reasons that have to do with COVID, for reasons that have to do with money, for reasons that have to do with all kinds of things. Uh, academia is in crisis. It is incredibly difficult to get a tenure track job now. Um, it is very difficult even to get a non-tenure track job. The so-called academic underclass is growing. This is a scandal. This is very, very, very bad news. Uh, and, and this must somehow be fixed. But until it is fixed, if it can be fixed, then even aside from the issues that I have just been emphasizing, I'm afraid I have to uh, urge caution. I don't like urging caution. Uh, when I was a student, I was not cautious. Even a few years ago, I would not have urged caution, but we're in an environment now for all sorts of reasons in which I'm afraid I think caution is necessary. Bottom line, the most important thing, if you are in any way associated with an institution that does not have the Chicago principles, or if you're on a non-academic institution, uh, and would like to adopt something like the Chicago principles for your institution, please go ahead and do it. It'll help a lot. Thank you, Professor. Uh, this is another question <laughs> submitted, uh, from the audience. Um, it says, uh, uh, Dan L. Padilla Peralta, who was your student from 2002 to 2006, is currently a classics professor at Princeton. In his memoir, he, Undocumented, that which came out in 2015, he praised your extraordinary mentorship to him as a student. You were the first person at Princeton to whom he confided about his undocumented status and you were extraordinarily supportive in attempting to resolve this dilemma with him. 
Um, your efforts were, of course, acknowledged in his memoir. At some point, your student uh, and mentee became a vehement critic of the current of what he called the white supremacy approaching approach to teaching the classics. He demonized what he considered white dominance of the field and its condescension and ignorance of the role of people of color. Um, he also viciously and vocally condemned your Independence Day letter as flag flagrant racism. How do you account for the evolution of your mentee, Padilla Peralta? Well, I don't, I don't, I mean, never mind that this is now being recorded and is going to go up on YouTube for perpetuity. Uh, I don't think it would be appropriate for me to talk about personal relations, even when they're academic cum personal relations uh, with uh, a specific person and especially somebody who is now a colleague. What I will say uh, is that, uh, is that uh, Danelle was one of the most remarkable undergraduates I have ever seen and ever taught. Um, that was and is a widely held view. He was an extraordinary undergraduate in, in every possible respect. Uh, and it makes me unhappy that we are now at odds. It would make me unhappy to be in a department at odds with people in department under any circumstances. But I have to say that this one hurts particularly, and perhaps he would say the same thing. I, just, I don't really know, but it hurts particularly because in fact, he was and is so talented. I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much, uh, Professor. Uh, another question from our audience asks if you can comment or are able to comment on uh, the dropping of the Woodrow Wilson name from the Princeton School of Public Policy. Uh, I, I pro well, I don't, I don't care very much. Um, it's hard for me to believe that I would have myself chosen to do it. I am reasonably confident that I would not have chosen to do it under the circumstances in which the removal happened. Um, those of you who are Yaleys, uh, there is a parallel here between what happened at Calhoun Grace Hopper and what happened with Woodrow Wilson. In both cases, uh, a committee was set up to make various recommendations. A recommendation was made, and then a couple of years uh, later, things changed. Uh, at, at, at Yale, uh, the change was made on the basis of a newly constituted committee, which as far as I understand it, had effectively the charge of undoing the first thing. Whereas here, it happened virtually overnight and it would seem, I suppose there's some dispute over this, but it certainly would seem to be the result of, uh, the very quick result of uh, mob action. And that I think is a very, very great mistake. In general, I don't like removing names from buildings. I don't like canceling buildings. I don't like canceling dead people any more than live people. Um, but compared to so many other issues, this one seems to me pretty low. So my main objection here has to do with procedure or at least perceived procedure rather than outcome. I don't like the outcome, let me be clear, but I mind the procedure or non-procedure or apparent non-procedure much more than I mind the outcome. Professor Katz, uh, you wrote something uh, that expressed a feeling in your Wall Street Journal op-ed that I think, uh, many on this call and many people uh, would have not taken the same view that you did, which is to say, um, I am certain that the university president was motivated by a concern for the Princeton community, as was I. Uh, you assigned good intentions to those who uh, um, took those actions. And I'm curious, that was written in July. Have your views changed at all about those who came after you that they at the end of the day had good intentions and were looking out for the Princeton community? Or do you, do you hold the same view now? 
Um, I hold the same view of the president. Uh, I, I believe, uh, I believe the, I would not have done what the, I mean, obviously I would not have done what the president did. And obviously I think the president would not have done what I did, but I believe him to be a reasonable, honorable man in a difficult situation. And he made a choice that I wouldn't have made, but I don't believe in any way that that was ad hominem. Um, many other people have said things that were clearly ad hominem from the start, and I still believe that they're ad hominem now. Sorry, I, I was muted. Uh, this question says, what advice do you have for a free thinking college student who fears backlash from their peers or faculty for speaking out against the norm? Uh, the first thing to do is to find a community. Uh, there will be a community. It will be more obvious in some places than others, uh, but no student here is going to be an island. It's very important to find like-minded people. And like-minded people doesn't mean, by the way, that everybody has to agree on every issue. In fact, it would be extremely boring and extremely strange if everybody did agree on every issue. But it should be possible at any place to find people who are still willing to engage in recent discourse and to do the sorts of things that one has traditionally and I believe appropriately done in academic settings. Uh, the other thing I would say is, well, I mean, I want to be a little bit careful of just how many messages I now receive. But if you're a student or a faculty member, member in trouble, uh, get in touch with me. I mean, everybody else is. So you may as well uh, uh, add on to it. Uh, you'll, you can find my email address easily enough. Um, write to me and I'll do my best to uh, help in part by putting you in touch with people who might be able to help you directly. That's very kind of you, Professor. So I think this will probably be our, our last question. Um, you mentioned earlier on in your talk that, uh, you know, of course, you are most comfortable uh, uh, talking about the areas in which you are a trained expert in linguistics and, and classics, philosophy. Um, and of course you are a renowned uh, expert on classics. So I wanna combine uh, your expertise in those areas with some of the content that we've covered today uh, with this question, which is uh, from an audience member. And it says, how do you think the field of classics is acting within the cancel culture wave? Is it acting in, a, in, except, in an exceptional way? And is there anything sort of unique going on here specifically within the field of classics? Mm. Um, classics is in very big trouble. Uh, classics has been in some kind of trouble for some time, I should say, uh, largely because it has been considered for better or for worse and both rightly and wrongly, a, a highly conservative discipline. Uh, in recent years, the dominant voices in classics have effectively flipped this. Uh, the idea now that classics is a highly conservative discipline in the United States is just wrong. There are, of course, people who are more conservative than the big voices that are out there uh, changing the idea of what classics is, but things have been flipped on its head. In effect, some time ago, one might have said that classics problem was that it was too conservative. Uh, and now I would say in, in recent years, the problem has been that the dominant weight is on the other side. So classics is now a field very much to my surprise, and I think very much to the surprise of a lot of people, uh, at the center of the culture wars. And to some extent, this is probably because um, some very smart and very vocal people realized that classics was quote unquote behind where some other disciplines were. And so they threw all possible weight at changing that and uh, boy did the balance tip. Professor Katz, on behalf of the Buckley program, uh, our fellows and, and uh, alums and donors who attended this, this event today, I want to thank you for spending time with us. Um, it was a fascinating 
uh, lecture that you provided. And um, thank you for getting through so many questions from the audience. And if you're an audience member and we didn't get to your question, I apologize, but, but we had many. Um, someday in the future, uh, when we're back to in-person programming, uh, we would love to have you back, Professor. So thank you so much. I'm always happy to return to Yale, to New Haven. Uh, thank you very much for having me and uh, good luck to you and to everyone.